You're not just gonna walk on by and not say howdy, are ya? After all, it's time for part two of the Spiderwood. Good news. During the night, Gwen took a stroll to Barsom's lair and divined the cup's location. Bad news. The cup is in the very heart of the forest, beneath the roots of the Felucian tree. In the very heart of the corrupted woods, where the hag Myrtle and her minions reside. Horrible news. Gwen's not alone. She brought a friend from somewhere. He's a dwarf. He's our new PC, and he's Jar Jar Binks' level of annoying. Each and every member of the party does his best to ignore the dwarf's existence from here on. Now, here's what we know. Barsom is dead. His lair looted. Myrtle has the thing we want. But the road to her lies through the marshes infested with angry elven ghosts. But the necromancer, he doesn't seem to be tied to the plot in any way at all. Perfectionists easily outvote the pragmatists, solely represented by Aizen, and we decide that our soul simply won't rest if we don't kill the necromancer before doing what we've been actually hired for. But before that, we head to the Huntsman Lodge to visit that one guy who we didn't meet, Audric. At least someone is happy to see us for a change. He wants to reward us for having saved his life with some jewelry he hid in the hollow tree, but we need his help to find it. We take our first NPC companion with us all the way to the place. Along the way we have two encounters. First we fight a couple ogres. Since we had a surprise round we easily killed them both. However as for the second one, it's spiders. About time we meet some since the place is called Spider Woods. Look at those guys in Monster Manual right now. Those are some beasts, especially in large numbers we met them in. They tear through our defenses easily, and their poison damage is downright brutal. The fact that none of us died is a testament solely to our tactical genius. Wounded, we have to seek shelter, and the nearby cave becomes our haven. While we rest, we can't shake off the feeling of being watched. This is a moment of respite, where our heroes are in relative safety, so they can afford to talk and find out more about each other. Dietrich was a learned man, well into his 40s, respected by his colleagues Bax and Drexenford and admired by many, yet he was not satisfied with his life anymore. He desired excitement, danger, a real man's life. He doesn't care for being an old professor taking exams from brain-dead students anymore. He's here to live by the sword on a life of adventure, the one that he always secretly yearned for. When he reclaims the relic, he'll finally prove to himself that he's not living his life in vain. Aizen desired to live by the sword too. He was a common soldier for years before becoming a mercenary he is now. The only reason he's seeking to reclaim the relic is to make a name for himself as a fighter and a mercenary. Maybe then he can join such legendary warriors as the Panzer Richters and live the good life as a knight. Never without food on his plate, a coin in his pocket, or a good fight before him again. Fiona also desired knighthood, but for a different reason. As a child, she was left by unknown parents to be raised in the Greentown Monastery, the home of the Knights of St. Fergus. Her entire life, she was surrounded by many young men trained to become holy warriors, yet despite all her religious fervor and righteous life, she could not become a knight herself. By reclaiming a holy relic, she could show the knights that she's just as righteous as they are and take her rightful place amongst her brothers. Gunnar did not have his brothers with him anymore. He lost them all back in the Forgotten North when he was not strong enough, not cunning enough to save them all. And now he found them, those brave fools, heading to their deaths without a care in the world like his comrades once did. He could not watch it happen again. Making sure they survive and reclaim the relic was his duty. Oh, yeah, there was the dwarf too, but we're still trying to ignore his existence as much as we can. We coined a name for him, however, the Old Fart. Our sorcerer is also still technically alive, but heavily burnt and totally catatonic after being caught in the middle of that explosion. And we still have our loyal huntsman, Audric, who probably really hates himself for agreeing to come with us now. So, 
the only exit leads back to the spider woods. The woods infested with deadly poisonous spiders who can hear crawl outside. We really don't want to use it because we still haven't morally recovered from our last fight with them, but what choice do we have, really? Well, we could use the gigantic door carved in the stone wall of the cave. Well, we couldn't since there seems to be no obvious way to open it. The solution comes to us soon. When the light of the moon touches the walls of the cavern, a magical writing appears which says something along the lines of, The gates of the tomb will only open themselves to the song of the dawn. I can just almost hear Tolkien doing cartwheels in his grave. Song of the Dawn. That sounds familiar. Didn't we read something like this in the Minotaur's diary? Yes, we have. But it's something else entirely from the Covenant, so we don't actually know what that thing does. But the Song of the Dawn is written down there. So our most charismatic party members could, theoretically, sing it. Fiona and Dietrich have a minor squabble about which one of them sings better, until they decide that they can sing the Song of the Dawn in duet just fine. Both rolled pretty respectable performance, but that's the moment when the DM says that he wants them to sing. Out loud. To say that it was a nightmarish experience is to say nothing at all. Neither of them had either the voice for singing or the hearing for it, so by the end of it, the DM was begging them to stop. It seems the gates could not bear it either, since they slowly opened, inviting the heroes inside. The place we ended up in turned out to be none other than a tomb of a great elven hero. Mighty was his sword arm and blessed was his blade. Yeah, yeah, whatever. None of us care about the knife ears that much. Old Fart continues cracking stupid jokes, but we don't really listen to him. Occasionally, Dietrich snaps back at him with a retort, but that's it. Suddenly, our feeling of being followed gets some closure. A tall, armored man suddenly comes from behind the corner. In one hand, he holds a warhammer. In the other, the holy symbol of the Sovereign, the one human god. He calls himself Sir Gregor, a knight from the Kingdom of Dulast. Fiona immediately asks him if he's looking for the relic too, but he just shakes his head. He doesn't know anything about the relic and he can't reveal his mission, but it's of extreme importance. Old Fart makes a mistake of insulting the elves again, and an arrow pierces the air, landing slightly below his feet. His attacker is Talendil, an elven woman and Gregor's companion, as he explains it. She does not take insults to her people well, so the dwarf should be watching his tongue. Before Old Fart manages a retort, Fiona warns him that neither she nor anyone really is going to protect him if he will continue picking fights. Nobody protests and Old Fart momentarily shuts up for the time being. Turns out both groups want to reach Felucian, so they unite. I keep wanting to say Fallujah. <laughs> the, both groups want to reach Fallujah. <laughs> Damn it, sorry. The tomb is surprisingly short and ends with a dead end. There's only a well filled with water there. Telendil reveals as a gate to the deeper level of the tomb. It's dormant now, but it can be awakened with blood magic. Fiona volunteers to give her blood again, but this time she actually has to follow through. The gate answers to her sacrifice, and elven magic takes us away. All of us except for Talendil appear in a tiny room with no exits. The ceiling creaks as it begins descending on our heads. Panicked, quivering, screaming, we look around, trying to figure out the way to escape this death trap. It must be a trap, right? Everything becomes clear when Gunnar finally looks down on the floor. Unlike the stone walls around, the blood-stained floor is metallic. It also has small holes in it. Their purpose is probably to let the blood flow down. This is not a trap. It's a sacrificial chamber. Gunnar yells at his discovery, and all as one we start smashing the floor with our weapons and stomping, trying to displace the metal plates. Elves probably didn't design it to endure so many armed and armored people, and we succeed. The floor crashes down and we fall down with it. After managing to not drown in the pool of blood, we climb out and look around. 
Who knows, maybe we're trapped again. No, this is indeed the second level of the tomb. We're surrounded by statues of the elven gods, the mother, the father, all of them false idols now. After recovering and catching our breath, we head deeper and soon meet with Talendil. She's alive and well, naturally. She claims that she had no idea that the gate took elves and non-elves to different places, though she probably could have seen it coming. We pretend to believe her. The air becomes colder as we venture deeper and deeper. Soon the interior of the tomb changes. As we enter the final chamber, the air is filled with mist. Millions of white threads cover the floor like a carpet, like a web. And then we hear him, the necromancer. Driven insane by isolation aeons ago, he's ranting at us, seeing faces of his enemies in the intruders. We shiver as he steps out of the shadows and shows himself. A colossal ancient drider with white hair so long it falls down the floor and covers it, filling the entire chamber. It's moving. It's twisting. It's grabbing us by our ankles and reaching for our necks. The necromancer is downright brutal. On every turn we rolled saving throws against being grappled by his hair. If we failed, we were damaged and unable to move. Given the fact that over half of our party fought in melee, it was downright crippling. He might have never moved, but we still couldn't approach him. Fiona was the only one who had backup weapons, her javelins, but could not be used for smites, and they ran out fast. Gunnar and Audric, however, carried their weight, being the best ranged damage dealers. While they were still damaged by the Necromancer's legendary actions, they weren't affected that badly by being unable to move. That is, until the Drider decided that playtime is over. He called forth the Shades from their resting places and commanded them to attack us. And this was the moment when we realized how fucked are we. In Monster Manual, Shades have less than one CR, but they are absurdly dangerous. Not only do they resist all non-magical damage, but each of their successful attacks reduces your strength. When your strength reaches zero, it's all over for you. Naturally, the part of our party that did not spend their youth in the gym started sweating. Audric was killed, may his soul find rest, and very soon we realize that unless a miracle happens, we will follow him really soon. And this is the moment when the party should have died. However, a rules mistake was made, and Gregor casted the Prayer of Healing, the spell that should have taken 10 minutes of casting time in a single action. Meanwhile, Fiona managed to reach the largest group of shades and turned undead. With his enemies funfairly restored to their full fighting capability and his servants turned, Necromancer started losing ground really, really quickly. When Aizen made the jump over him and landed right behind his back, flinking him with Dietrich, it was all decided. While part of the party mourns that poor Audric, who never asked to be a part of this shit, the rest starts looting the tomb of the great elven hero for his great elven treasures. The most obvious treasure of all of them was his plus one greatsword. It's untouched by rust after all those years, its blade is white like milk. Naturally, Dietrich, the only man who uses two-handed weapons in his party, and also the closest thing this group has to a leader, claims it for himself. The second object in the possession of the necromancer is a human eye. It's still moving and glaring at us. It's obviously magical, but we do not understand a thing beyond that, so we just take it with us. And finally, the necromancer, much like Barsum, had a diary in his possession. It's found by Talendil. Momentarily, she opens it, turns pages as if knowing what to look for, and tears out the last few. When questioned about it, she answers that those secrets belong only to the elves, and man is not meant to hold them. Dietrich takes a guess. Maybe it's related to the Covenant? When he speaks the word... Talendil's face changes, and it continues changing when we mention that we already have a third of it. She shows us some extremely expensive gems and offers us them all. 
if we simply hand over the covenant to her. But she also resists probing for information. Dietrich is having none of it. If she wants to hoard the covenant for herself and refuses to tell its purposes, she's not getting our part. To cement his claims, he tears Barsom's diary apart. Now neither party has a way of learning the part of the covenant belonging to the other, unless they talk it out. While traveling to the surface, Dietrich does try to talk it out. And by that, I mean he's trying to make a move on Talandiel, repeatedly. Midlife crises, you'll fuck us all. Both parties seem to agree on one thing. We need each other, and whatever differences and issues might have right now really don't matter. We can work them all out after we reach Felution, but after that we have to work together if we want to survive. So Talendil doesn't even seem to mind our rude gesture with the Covenant that much. It helps that she's so racist that she expected such a thing from humans. She even shares the Necromancer's diary with us, the part that doesn't hold the Covenant. Anyway, turns out it doesn't belong to him, but to some half-elf who infiltrated the elven society. He speak about elven savagery, about the great evil that will soon fuck them all, and again the name of the priestess Merilith is dropped. The writer seems to think she's fucking creepy. Dietrich, meanwhile, is acting really strangely ever since he dealt the final blow to the necromancer. Not only he's having bad, not only is he having bad dreams, he also seemed to learn magic overnight. Magic that really came in handy for us, so he did not ask questions. It was his business. Talendil leads us out of the tomb and takes us through the hidden elven path to the ruins of an elven city. This is Myrtle's territory and probably the most dangerous part of the spider woods except for the marshes, so naturally we behave really, really carefully and listen to every word that Tallendeel says. Just kidding. We get too close to a lake and wake a colossal magic octopus that immediately tries to kill us all. Nice uh, Moria callback there, pal. Once again, we're forced into the dungeon just because it's the handiest escape route, Moria, but this time it was our actual destination. Those tunnels lead inside the city, which means to Felution. Well, we don't actually have time to ponder that. We were too busy running at the top of our speed since the monster's nimble tentacles were trying to winkle us out of the tunnels. We only stopped running when we entered a very... Very strange place. Hey guys, this is just a quick bit of promo. We got our website up and running and we have a massive restock on most of the models. However, one of the cool things about the website is if there's a model that you're waiting on, you can enter your email and be put on a waiting list. And it's not just good for you so then you'll know when they're restocked. We can also see what you guys are waiting on and what we should be printing. <laughs> so either way, the models are by far the best way to support this channel. And to help us do videos that YouTube would find inappropriate on the platform. <laughs> and like, let's be serious, the models are pretty based looking, so once again, just look at the titties. Look at the lizard titties! <laughs> but anyway, let's continue on with the video. It was a cavern, a gigantic hall filled with hundreds of cheering monsters, kobolds, grimlocks, lizardmen, all kinds of scum and villainy gathered in one place, feasting and drinking. At least, that's what it looked like upon the first sight, but when we actually paid more attention to it, the place suddenly began seeming more familiar and bizarre at the same time, especially to Fiona. In the middle of the cavern, there was a colossal round pit, filled with bones and stained with blood. It was surrounded by uncountable numbers of benches and badly made chairs, upon which monsters were sitting, holding sticks with colored rags attached to them. They cheered loudly for whatever happenings entertained them. There was a gigantic wooden stand in the distant counter, corner, counter, behind which stood a troll with a crossbow. Near him, there were about 20 wooden barrels filled with all kinds of brews. There was even a merchant with his own carriage full of wares. And to top it off, there was one goblin unlike the others, sitting on a quite well-made throne, obviously stolen from the ruins, and he wore a wooden crown. To the left side of him stood a giant toad, and to the right was his herald, a loud-mouthed goblin who was just announcing the unexpected guests, meaning us. They were playing humans. They were all trying to simulate human life as they understood it, with made-up titles and banners in their own tournament. 
and we were honored foreign knights. The Herald introduces the Goblin Chief as Cocker King, King of the Big Cockers. He also informs us that we're just in time for the tourney. We are invited to sit down, eat, drink, and most importantly, take part. This is not a request. As the Herald reads the long list of the participants and all of their titles, the party is offered all kinds of foul-smelling food and most importantly, drinks. While Gunnar is visibly strained, the explanation is obvious. He hates greenskins with a passion, so he's barely restraining himself from trying to kill them all right now. But Fiona, meanwhile, is having a great time. She's really entertained by how monsters try to imitate humans, and hey, they recognize her as a knight. Everybody else is acting pretty chill. Old Fart even eats what he recognizes as human meat and eyes and tries their brew. But Dietrich, Dietrich is gonna have none of it. He stands up and steps forward, pointing his finger at the Cocker King himself. They have no time for this, he says. Let's settle this right now. You and me, single combat. The entire group puts on forced smiles as they look on their insane companion with obvious worry. The Cocker King doesn't even think for a second. He merely agrees to Dietrich's challenge, hops on his toad mount and rides forward to the arena. He intends to fight with a wooden crutch. Dietrich, being the learned man he is, recognizes the obvious danger of the giant toad and the obvious advantage of the reach weapons. So he switches to his glaive instead of his magic sword. Both Fiona and Sir Gregor realize that Dietrich is taking a huge gamble right now, so he must win. They pray to the higher power and bestow him with buffs while nobody is looking. As the monster crowd cheers, the party laughs nervously as the fight begins. Cheaters. First of all, Dietrich probably should have asked for a mount, even if he probably wouldn't have got one. Giant Toad is a dangerous foe for a single human to fight. But Dietrich manages to keep it at range and use his battle master maneuvers in a clever manner. For some time it almost seems like that he's going to make it. The damn beast is half dead and King Cocker is clearly looking worried. But no, he's devoured alive instead. The crowd cheers for the dead hero, while the party looks at the arena in shock and in disbelief, unsure of what to do. But Eisen knows exactly what to do. Unsheathing both of his swords, he yells, Two against one isn't fair! and jumps to the arena. The crowd stops cheering and starts orgasming. They're throwing weapons and barrels at the ring as Eisen finishes the toad off. Before this, King Cocker was clearly enjoying this, but the moment his pet monster dies, his face instantly becomes grim. He throws away his crutch and takes out a spiked club drenched in manticore poison. In one hit, he almost kills Eisen where he stands, but for the rest of the battle, things aren't going in his favor. The poison was a one-time thing, while Eisen's weapons are overall superior. When the Goblin King drops dead on the ground, the crowd goes berserk. And I do not mean that cheering for the winner. No, they actually go berserk. The monsters pull out their weapons. The troll bartender arms, arms aims his gigantic crossbow. The shamans begin chanting their spells. Apparently, people don't like it when you kill their kings. The group gets on their feet and stand back to back, looking at the countless screaming enemies around, all thirsting for their blood. At this moment, my memory of the session turns into the red haze. There are no words that can do this fight justice. It was pure fucking carnage. Even if half of the monsters ran when the Cocker King fell, the remaining half was the largest and most brutal encounter I've ever seen in my life. Those weren't one-hit point wonders like 4E minions. Those were full-blown monsters just like they were described in Monster Manual. It was pure carnage. Monsters were dying left, right, and center, and heroes fell on the ground and bled out, only to be raised from the zeros and thrown into the fight again. 
The troll's crossbow was fired and reloaded and fired again, and every time he fired it, a die was rolled to see in which direction this monstrosity will misfire. His arrows, no, his projectile spears were as lethal as cannonballs as they tore through combatants, both us and his allies. Sir Gregor did not allow anybody to outdo his kill count. His maximized thunder wave almost killed Dietrich, who was just cut out from the dead toad's belly, but it also pulverized countless greenskins. Goblin bodies formed hills on which we stood our ground and butchered them all. Lizard shamans were raining fire and blood upon us and their own, blinded by the bloodlust. Aizen and Dietrich cleaved through their ranks one by one, while Talendil and Gunnar were raining the troll with arrows. Fiona, screaming in battle fervor, blindly charged into an ogre, her flail burning with holy fire. Sir Gregor's hammer was a thunder made iron, cracking skulls, while his holy symbol shined with light, bringing those close to dying back from the brink to fight again. Even Old Fart was doing something useful, engaging in a duel with enemy spellcasters and spraying them with poison. When the ranks of Big Cocker started growing thin, we thought that might be the end, but it was only the beginning. The slave masher rushed to his masher? The slave master rushed to the cages and let their best gladiators loose. The ogre called Tusk was the supreme fighter, while the knoll hide was able to disappear into thin air without a single trace. We barely had anything left in us as it was, and some of the cockers still lived. Even the troll bartender with his crossbow was still an ever-present threat. We could not hold out much longer. Our spells came to an end. Aizen was corpse tanking yet again, while Dietrich carried surprisingly hard for someone who was barely alive a few minutes ago. Fiona was smashed into the ground by an ogre, still alive but rapidly dying, while Talendil was utterly outmatched by Hyde. That's when Dietrich had the brightest idea he's ever had in his entire life as a professor. He breathed in, and with all the strength that was left in his lungs, he began shouting, The king is dead. Now the largest must become the king of the big cockers. And he rolled for bluff. In literally any other situation, it would not work. We would fail. We would all die right there and right now. But our most lethal enemies were an ogre and a troll. There was a pause, and then they charged right into each other. The troll was a resilient enemy, able to regenerate any wound, but Tusk could not give less fucks about what the bartender could or could not regenerate. He tore his enemy apart limb by limb again and again, and each time the troll would regenerate, he would scream and tear him into pieces again. This gave us much needed time to gather our strength and turn it on Hyde, decimating him in a single round. Then Talendil jumped into the fight between the big boys with a torch. His regeneration was halted and he promptly died. Killing the lone, heavily wounded ogre proved easy. When we were finished, we looked upon the battlefield and saw nothing but an endless field of corpses. And we stood on it as winners. First of all, DM declared that the session is over for today, since the entire scene went off the rails the moment Dietrich called for a duel with the king, which was something he did not predict. Even though he really should have, since he knew that player for years. But we were supposed to take part in the tourney. He even showed us some really impressive notes detailing every little thing we could do there and custom mechanics for crowd's level of love towards the fighters. Since this gigantic battle was not something he predicted, he didn't really count CR2, so he's going to do it right now. After he finished, he said this, You know how certain thresholds were supposed to be deadly for you? Well, it was seven times that, and all of us survived. This is a... Um, fuck. Old Fart survived. After giving us enough XP to level up right there, the DM left to prepare for the next session, since the plot took a very different turn now. 
He left, and we immediately started discussing how fucking cool this whole fight was. Even though looking at his notes, doing the thing as planned would have probably be more fun, though significantly less metal, we defeated the encounter seven times deadly. We are the champions. We are invincible and undefeatable. We're full of pride. And pride goeth before the fall. We left the first level of the dungeon and proceeded to the second after taking a full rest. A few sessions full of little things followed, nothing I'm going to describe in depth at least. First, an entire session was wasted on old fart while chipping into a crocodile, swimming back and forth between a lizardman merchant and the party, trying to haggle for a magic item. Then there was the time when we left the dungeon for some clear air for a few seconds, only to realize that we ended up in the marshes. We fought quite a few orc zombies and Aizen got a magical axe for himself. Then there was this time when the party found royal living quarters, including a luxurious bathroom. Fiona was the only one to use the opportunity to clean herself, while the rest of the party decided to go further without her and ended up fighting ghouls. When she heard the sounds of battle, she jumped out of the bath and rushed to help her friends just like that. Fan service ensued. There was a fight with several mimics who infested the living quarters. That was nothing special, though. Then we found a lab belonging to local elven Dr. Mengele, who performed horrible experiments with humans, trying to make them immortal like elves. Since the doctor was thousands of years dead, we just burned his research notes, smashed his lab, and that was the best we could do. There was also this time when we fought a shitload of rust monsters with sticks because we were too afraid to damage our equipment. And this one time when we found the mage quarters and found the last will of the city's archmage. That one allowed us to take everything we wanted from him, but pleaded us to leave his ornate mystery box with him. The DM actually gave us XP for playing against our type, not being autistic murder hobos and not robbing the dead wizard. It was all pretty great, in the hindsight. Frankly, we all grew very close together as a team. Nobody had much love for old fart still, but at a certain point he stopped being that annoying. He just kinda grew on us. Gunnar nearly killed Fiona in the very beginning when he saw her face. Now he treated her like a little sister in need of guidance. Dietrich looked down on the others, but now everyone looked up to him as a brave and powerful leader. Even Tallendil transcended being a racist asshole slightly and became a lovable asshole instead. But you know what never changed? Our constant need to explore and shove our noses where they don't belong. It happened in a tiny, narrow branch of the caverns, an utter dead end on the second level. It held something of interest, a human skeleton in a full looking sack. Alarm bells started going off in Gunnar's head as he tried to warn his companions not to approach it. But it was too late. It moved like lightning. A long tentacle came out of nowhere and grabbed Tallendil by the ankle. The elf didn't even have the time to scream. She was pulled into the darkness in the blink of an eye, and her head disappeared in the monstrous maw. And just like that... She died. We stared at the roper with wide open eyes. Then we began screaming. We ran. We ran without looking back. When we stopped to catch our breath, we just looked at each other, unable to comprehend what just happened. She just... died. She survived through so much with us. She couldn't just die in a second. We wanted to go back and make sure if she's dead, but we were too terrified of dying too. But old Fart has an idea. He grabs a potion of invisibility he found earlier and takes a sip. Before we could stop him, he disappeared without a trace. The dwarf came back. He saw Tallendil's headless body lying lifeless on the stone. Her hands clenched her bow, and her bag was still hanging on her shoulders. The bag. He knew little of the Covenant, just like us, but he knew it was important. He knew it's got something to do with ancient darkness imprisoned here, and he knew that we only possess one third of it. The second part was in her bag. So, he took the risk. 
He could not see the Roper anymore, but he was sure he was still there. But maybe if he walks very, very silently, he can approach her body, reach for her bag, and quickly rush back. But when the monster saw the elf's body move, it knew exactly what was going on. He launched every one of his tentacles forward, and one of them managed to grab the dwarf's arm. The next thing we heard were his screams. We could not just stand there, even if we knew what was going to happen to us. We rushed back, weapons in our hands, ready to fight this time. He might have been an annoying prick, but he was one of us, and we could not abandon him to die. Not without at least trying to save him. When we reached the Roper, the dwarf was still alive. He was quiet as if accepting his fate, as the tentacles were choking him. Fiona charged forward without thinking, flail in her hands. She struck the monster again and again, but the beast's hide was as strong as steel. None of us could as much as touch him reliably. And worse than that, the tunnel in which the Roper was hiding was so narrow only one of us could be fighting it in melee at once and flanking him was absolutely impossible. Gunnar did not risk shooting. He could hit Fiona and kill her if he wasn't careful enough. Fighting the Roper at all was pure tactical suicide. When the dwarf died and the tentacles grabbed our paladin, it seemed like a foregone conclusion. We should be running while we still have the chance. But running was not an option. Sir Gregor lifted his hammer up and began chanting a prayer to the Sovereign. And out of nowhere, a gust of wind appeared, blowing the heroes away from the beast. Even Fiona was pulled from the Roper's grasp. The Roper hissed, robbed of his prey, but he could do little. When we ran as fast as we could, abandoning the bodies of our comrades and leaving the Covenant behind. Our next long rest was spent in mourning and despair. We blamed our greed for the losses that we suffered. Nor could we forget the loss of the Covenant. Only Talendil knew its true purpose beyond keeping the dark at bay, and she was gone, along with her piece of the spell. Occasionally, Fiona tried to mumble something about how we could still retrieve it, how we could still make it, but she was shut down every time. We've already had enough of playing heroes. Alright, that's the end of part two of the story. The next part will be part three. That should be the ending of the particular saga. I had no idea that the story was this fucking long. But if you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia and click the bell icon so you know when the stories are released through the week. If you like even more original stories, be sure to stop by Guard Beardia while I'm writing up the f well, actually where I'm finishing up the first book of the Veil vale Riders and working on still through the Emily Bronze series book two of the Veil vale Rider series to come out soon TM also be sure to stop by the Guard Beardia Discord the Neck Beardia Discord the Neck Beardia model marketplace as well as Guard Beardia miniature reviews to see those models and see them painted and until I see you next time on this side of the Veil vale, this has been Guard Bro. And this is Nick Beardia.